Today we are going to talk all about dopamine and what drives you to do the things that you do. We're going to talk about motivation and desire and craving, but also how dopamine relates to satisfaction and our feelings of well-being. Before we dive into the meat of today's discussion, I'd like to share with you a fascinating result that really underscores what dopamine is capable of in our brains and bodies and underscores the fact that just through behaviors, no drugs, nothing of that sort, just through behaviors, we can achieve terrifically high increases in dopamine that are very long and sustained in ways that serve us. This is a result that was published in the European Journal of Physiology. I'll go into it in more detail later, but essentially what it involved is having human subjects get into water of different temperatures. So it was warm water, moderately cool water, and cold, cold water. Had them stay in that water for up to an hour, and they measured, by way of blood draw, things like cortisol, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Most people have heard of dopamine, and we hear all the time now about dopamine hits. But actually, there's no such thing as a dopamine hit. And actually, the way that your body uses dopamine is to have a baseline level of dopamine, meaning an amount of dopamine that's circulating in your brain and body all the time. And that turns out to be important for how you feel generally, whether or not you're in a good mood, motivated, etc., and you also can experience peaks in dopamine above baseline. Now, this has a very specific name in the neurobiology literature, so-called tonic and phasic release of dopamine. And I'll explain what that means in a couple of minutes. But if you remember nothing else from this episode, please remember this, that when you experience something or you crave something really desirable, really exciting to you, very pleasurable, what happens afterwards is your baseline level of dopamine drops, okay? So these peaks in dopamine, they influence how much dopamine will generally be circulating afterward. And you might think, oh, a big peak in dopamine. After that, I'm going to feel even better because I just had this great event. Not the case. What actually happens is that your baseline level of dopamine drops. And I will explain the precise mechanism for that, okay? In the neuroscience literature, we refer to this as tonic and phasic release of dopamine. Tonic being the low level baseline that's always there circulating, released into your brain all the time. And then phasic, these peaks that ride above that baseline. And those two things interact. And this is really important. So let's talk about the baseline of dopamine that we all have and the peaks in dopamine that we all can achieve through different activities and things that we ingest. All of us have different baseline levels of dopamine. Some of this is sure to be genetic. Some people just simply ride at a level a little bit higher, a little bit more excited, they're a little bit more motivated, or maybe they're a lot more excited or a lot more motivated. Some people are a little mellower. Some people are a little less excitable. And some of that has to do with the fact that dopamine doesn't act alone. Dopamine has close cousins or friends in the nervous system. And I'll just name off a few of those close cousins and friends. Epinephrine, also called adrenaline, is the main chemical driver of energy. We can't do anything, anything at all, unless we have some level of epinephrine in our brain and body. It's released from the adrenal glands, which ride atop our kidneys. It's released from an area of the brainstem called locus ceruleus. And its release tends to wake up neural circuits in the brain and wake up various aspects of our body's physiology and give us a readiness. Chocolate. They didn't look at milk versus dark chocolate, but chocolate will increase your baseline level of dopamine 1.5 times. Sex. Both the pursuit of sex and the act of sex increases dopamine two times. So it's a doubling above baseline. Nicotine. In particular, nicotine that is smoked, like cigarettes and so forth, increases dopamine two and a half times above baseline. So there's a peak that goes up above baseline two and a half times higher. Cocaine will increase the level of dopamine in the bloodstream two and a half times above baseline. 
And amphetamine, another drug that increases dopamine, will increase the amount of dopamine in the bloodstream 10 times above baseline. A tremendous increase in dopamine. Exercise. Now, exercise will have a different impact on the levels of dopamine depending on how much somebody subjectively enjoys that exercise. So if you're somebody who loves running, chances are it's going to increase your levels of dopamine two times above your baseline. Not unlike sex. But now you have a sense of how much dopamine can be evoked by different activities and by different substances. One that you might be wondering about is caffeine. I'm certainly drinking my caffeine today and I do enjoy caffeine in uh, limited uh, quantities. I drink yerba mate and I drink coffee and I love it. Does it increase dopamine? Well, a little bit. Caffeine will increase dopamine to some extent, but it is pretty modest compared to the other things that I described. Now, the smartphone is a very interesting tool for dopamine in light of all this. It's extremely common nowadays to see people texting and doing selfies and communicating in various ways, listening to podcasts, listening to music, doing all sorts of things while they engage in other activities or going to dinner and texting other people or making plans, sharing information. That's all wonderful. It gives depth and richness and color to life. But it isn't just about our distracted nature when we're engaging with the phone. It's also a way of layering in dopamine. And it's no surprise that levels of depression and lack of motivation are really on the increase. Now I'd like to talk about the positive aspects of rewards for our behavior and the negative aspects of rewards for our behavior. And from that, I will suggest a protocol by which you can achieve a better relationship to your activities and to your dopamine system. In fact, it will help tune up your dopamine system for discipline, hard work, and motivation. One straightforward example of learning to attach dopamine to effort and strain as opposed to a process or a reward that naturally evokes dopamine release is so-called intermittent fasting. One of the lesser talked about compounds that's out there, but that's gaining popularity for increasing dopamine and as a so-called nootropic is something called Hooperzine A. Hooperzine A is a compound sold over the counter, at least in the United States, that can increase acetylcholine transmission, a different neuromodulator entirely. But what's interesting is that Hooperzine A somehow, by way of interactions between the cholinergic system and the dopaminergic system, leads to increases in dopamine in the medial prefrontal cortex and hippocampus 